What's good, Ken Gonda? It's your boy, O'Shea Duke Jackson. Back at it again with a great episode here on the channel, guys. Make sure you like and comment and subscribe. And today we got a very powerful brother, really big in the repatriation community. I've seen this brother um, with the Exodus Alliance. I've seen him around. And a few weeks ago, I asked him, would he come on? And he finally got some time today. But I'm going to let you uh, let him explain who he is and where he lives and a little bit more about himself. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, man. So, thank you, brother. I appreciate the opportunity to bless the platform. Um, of course, my name is Chief Ode Ajamo Mansure. Um, I'm from the United States of America. I was born in the state of Pennsylvania. But I have um, Gullah Geechee roots tracing back to South Carolina and Georgia. Um, very, very centered around my heritage connection with on the continent, particularly with Sierra Leone, where I've been living since 2013. So I got almost almost a decade, almost nine years in February, um, living out here and, and basically being domiciled here in Freetown, um, where I do a lot of different things. You know, I do from community organizing, um, you know, doing things like public service work from cleaning communities to uh, uh, starting urban gardens with youth to, uh, you know, we have a we have a tour service, you know, we do heritage tours. We also assist people who's seeking their citizenship um, through African Ancestry DNA and other, you know, other companies where they meet the requirements to come back and get their citizenship here in Sierra Leone. Um, so that's what I'm really, really involved in. My background, I'm an average working class brother. You know, um, in America, I did, I worked from, um, you know, McDonald's to, you know, the trash, I, I, I worked on the trash truck, you know, I have owned business as well. Um, but my real passion and my real calling, um, even in the United States, has always been to find the best way to serve um, my community, my family, with my skills and my talents that I accumulate through my studies and, of course, my services. So um, for the last 22 years, um, just no matter what situation I've been in, no matter how much money I, money I've had, um, what continent I've lived in, you know, um, what community I've lived in, I've always been actively involved in um, in the struggle, you know, in the struggle to um, make conditions better for the masses of people who are poor, oppressed. So that ultimately brought me back to Africa, man. I'm a pan Africanist. Mm -hmm. I want I want mm -hmm. to reach out and connect with people like me on the continent. Mm -hmm. I want to swap mm -hmm. skills. And it led me into a whole different kind of journey, bro. Um, okay. Ended up playing a real role of supporting people on the ground and getting to know them personally okay. and like just falling in love with the ability to, to add a connection to the point that I was like, man, listen, I need to come home. I need to be there to fill it and, right. and really see what's going on. And first, I didn't know how long I was going to be here, but I knew you I had stayed, to come huh? here. Okay. Yeah, I knew I had let to let come. Me... And once I came, it was like, yo, this is where I need to be. This is where I need to be. And that was around eight years ago, right? Yeah, 2013, brother. 2013. Let me let me ask you this because it's so many people, and you know me, we, we've talked briefly on Facebook. Um, I, I knew of you. You knew something about me, but um, but I've after watching you on Brother RJ Mahdi's channel and the Exodus Alliance with Sister Yah, I've gotten a little bit of a better understanding of who you are because you like to talk a lot. You're a, you what I would consider a mic heavy person, so you dominate the the majority of the the trio podcast that you guys have. And um, so, but but what I want to talk about is because so many people have been coming to, you know, as African-Americans, we feel more connected to West Africa in comparison to East or Southern Africa. So, so many people are going to Ghana and I see so many people interested. Um, we have some of the Nigerian roots, um, even some connection to Liberia. We were talking about that. But you chose Sierra Leone, you know, and, and you know, outside of going to Ghana Nigeria, yeah. Togo. Why why Sierra Leone out you know before they was given citizenship? So why did you choose that place other than any other place in West Africa? Right. Well, I get I get asked the question uh, often. So I kind I try to sum it up in, in in just a few um short short ways. One way, um I'm a Gullah Geechee and Gullah Geechee people have a very strong two-way connection to Sierra Leone. Historically, linguistically, culturally, um, just holistically, there's a very strong connection between the Gullah Geechee people of, uh, of, of uh, Georgia, South Carolina, um, Florida, 
and um, in North Carolina, the Sea Islands, and the Low Country, those people have a very direct relationship with the um, the slave trade between Bunts Island, Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. and Charleston, South Carolina. So mm -hmm. there's like a direct connection with ancestrally that there was mm -hmm. a lot of people from this country who mm -hmm. went from here and went to the plantations in South Carolina where my ancestors were enslaved and where I come from. So I, knowing that history, I've always connected strongly with Sierra Leone, but also mm -hmm. knowing that um, being an admirer of, of Marcus Garvey, Mark Delaney, you know, those who really thought about Africa as being home, mm -hmm. um, I really began to look at Sierra Leone as potentially a place where I could go. And it's a lot of people, bro, because this country had 11 year war from 1991 to 2002. And people just seen the, the movie Blood Diamonds and was like, oh no, hell no. But for me, I was seeking to come back as an asset. I, w I came back as a Pan-African. I came back after having a six year relationship with um, brothers and sisters who was on the ground here in the struggle already. So I came to join what was already happening as opposed to just coming to, you know, buy some land or, you know, get some diamonds or some gold, the typical BS. Um, I actually was moved to come home to join what I considered family, comrades who was um, mm -hmm. definitely doing the same kind of thing that I would like to do when I come home to Africa. So I came back right. like that. And it, it, it really didn't mm -hmm. matter to me. It, what mattered to me was where I was going to have the strongest impact. And I seen Ghana right. and I'm like, wow, man, you know, Ghana looked a little pricey for me, man. I'm a little working class dude, you know? Um, right. I looked at Sierra Leone and was like, well, at least, you know, the cost of living is going to be a little, you know, a little more reasonable. You know, um, I'm not from, I'm not from Uppity Land, but I'm from the hood. So it wasn't difficult for me to adapt to the city of Freetown. The same struggles, just different, you know, different environment, different people, different place. So um, I came with the intentions to okay. be an asset. I came with the intentions to transfer skills that I had gained throughout years of serving my communities in America and bring that back home and try to find the best way where we can, um, you know, bridge the gap in terms of resources and, and just getting people mm -hmm. back together. So um, mm -hmm. the, everything else came secondary to that. So I came mm -hmm. legitimately and genuinely to, to, uh, to, to see how far and, and, and what benefit I could be in the struggle here in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. um, I never plan to just stay here and get stuck. Um, another reason why I chose Sierra Leone, because like I said, for six years I had been involved. In 2007, I met a journalist from Sierra Leone who's a uh, Pan-Africanist here, very well-known Pan-Africanist here. And um, a, a friendship developed where we always, you know, stay up on each other. And then a working relationship developed as well to a, a common organization that we had membership in. And um, yes, I ended up starting my own organization. He ended up starting his own organization. And we just kept it cordial until the point that, um, you know, when I was ready to come back, he was able to receive me. And so um, that's how I came back. Bro. It was really a genuine outgrowth of um, movement work that brought me back to Africa. So I wanted to be where the struggle was at. I wanted to be where people um, um, still had a sense of urgency about changing things. I didn't want mm -hmm. to be somewhere where people were just sitting around lazy and trying to enjoy the scene. I wanted to be where people was really about improving the educational system now now. And um, Sierra Leone got one of them environments where people are always on recovery mode, we're always talking about problems, very, um, I would say, extremely intelligent population naturally, although literacy, illiteracy is so high. The natural intelligence of Sierra Leoneans is through the roof, bro. Like just the problem solving, you know, the way that they have of, of reconciliation and governing themselves is very admirable when you're here. So if I can answer your question, that really is what, you know, brought me here. Okay, let me let's talk about a little bit of this because you've been um, a part again of the Excellence Alliance. I think that you guys have like a weekly show there. Uh, it's yeah. very informative. I've been to Africa over sixteen times, but uh, for you, even me, I learn a lot. And the topic of the day is why because because Sierra Leone has been the first country, even though Ghana has been doing you know the year of return and giving citizenships here and there. Sierra Leone is uh, the country saying, hey, if you can prove that you come from here through African ancestry, we'll it. give you citizenship. I've seen, I mean, oh, I've, yeah. I've looked at your coronation as a year and year now, a chief uh, uh, amongst this, the community there. I've seen Brother yeah. Dynast, Amir from Search for Uhuru, um, mm -hmm. get his citizenship. And Sierra Leone is the country that's saying, hey, if you come from here, 
We want you to come back and not only just come back. Here's the citizenship that you can come here and do things here. So, oh, yeah. but I want to ask you this outside of the other places, because, you know, uh, infrastructure is important for a lot of people. People are asking a lot of questions. Okay, Sierra Leone will give me citizenship, but Jim, what? But why is Sierra Leone um, the, the the choice? If you were to say, come to a country and, 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 and want to move or repatriate here, why is Sierra Leone the best choice for the African-American community in comparison to these other countries who are yeah. starting to open up their doors like Rwanda, Botswana, places like that? Why is Sierra Leone still your choice for the brothers to come in and do it there? Right. Well, I think that because the cooperation that we'll be able to meet on the ground with the um, with the traditional authorities, the people who actually have access to the real the real resources that we need to really um, have access to to really play our role here as well in Africa. So, you know, um, I think that it's not only the partnerships, but I think that it's the opportunities in terms of being expected and having tangible, um, you know, tangibility, having a citizenship. You know, it's not just about having a, a, a DNA test and getting an immediate citizenship. Sierra Leone also has very um, 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 considerable um, processes to get naturalization. You can get naturalized in Sierra Leone in five years. You know what I'm saying? Um, you can get your um, your residency and maintain your residency for five years, and you can go for your citizenship after that. Some countries, it's 15 years. It's seven years, you know? Um, but I also would say that spiritually, Sierra Leone is the first place that the African diaspora ever returned to and formed a permanent settlement. Freetown is the evidence of that. Um, spiritually, with all of this awakening and people coming home, I think that we have over um, overlooked Sierra Leone and the role that Sierra Leone has played historically and um and and where we come from and also where we return back to. Very, very important. We were just talking about um next year being the bicentennial since the um establishment of Liberia. And um, you know, that's impossible without Freetown being established. You know, Freetown was established 30 years before um, Monrovia. And if Freetown wasn't established, the people who went and established Monrovia would have never had the ability to do it because they came to Freetown first and then went down and established, um, you know, Liberia. So when you know the history, you understand that this is a marked place. This is a place that already has to be one of the destinations. Um, also, I would say the proximity of Liberia to, um, to Sierra Leone. Also, the English speaking is very important, especially for those of us coming from English speaking diaspora countries. Um, there's only five in West Africa. You got Nigeria, you got Liberia, you got Ghana, you got Gambia, and you got Sierra Leone. Um, the common language here is Creole, but people understand English. And that's very important for communication, for doing business. Now, in terms of um, land ownership and stuff like that here, Unless you're a citizen, you can lease hold land, but you can't freehold land. You can lease hold land, but you can't freehold land. Meaning that um, you can lease land up to 99 years, but you can't own it all, all, you know, completely forever if you're not a citizen. So they have that protection. Also, in the Constitution, Sierra Leone as well as Liberia still maintains what they, what they call a Negro clause. Um, if you're not a Negro, you're not supposed to become a citizen of Sierra Leone, no matter what. And that means that our ancestors were wise enough to put that um, that that ideal out there. And it started in Liberia, and then Sierra Leone, you know, piggybacked on it after um, independence here to kind of block the um, you know the Lebanese and other people who they felt that those shouldn't have access to the power to the state power, and made a Negro clause there. If you're in a Negro, then um, you know you can't you can't you know can't be a citizen you can be something else but you can't be a citizen so mm -hmm. um Sierra Leone has that kind of you know energy also I would say that the youth population here about 70 percent of the population you know the energy that they have and the momentum that they have to really push the country forward is admirable compared to where I see you know um when I go on media all I see is our youth smoking on packs of each other you know um 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 playing with hip-hop gang banging using media to gang bang over here, man, you actually find you actually find you around trees and read books after school. You know, you find people that's actually um, in in the in the most disadvantaged kind of situation, um, doing the most, like really trying. So having that kind of energy, having a population that's ready to grind for their own, they just need the support of people who really genuinely care. Yeah, 
you know, that's still the own. In terms of cost mm -hmm. of living, bro, mo most of the food, man, we grow it ourselves. So it's okay. okay. out here, bro. And then when you look at it, we have a rainforest in the south. We have the, the, the coast on, you know, along the west coast. But then we also have the mountains in the north. So we got, mm -hmm. we got three different terrains and mm -hmm. you can grow everything. I'm talking about, man, we got animal husbandry here, all kind of that. We got, um, you can go to Kabbalah and get all kind of fruits and vegetables you've never seen in your life before. Big, big, big fruits and vegetables, organic ones. You can go in the mm -hmm. South and get palm oil. You can get cocoa. You can get uh, uh, rice. You know, so it's just like the country is like so small. It's only about the size of, of, of South Carolina that you can jump around so easy and move and meet people. And there's 17 different ethnicities and the people are genuinely kind. I ain't saying that they sweet, you know, you ain't going to get over on them, but they're genuinely kind about um, how they deal with, with us. You know what I'm saying? Um, in 1988, the president of this country went to, went, to, went to South Carolina to go mend the connection between this country and, and Gullah Geechee people. 1989, Gullah Geechee people came back over here to um, reciprocate their appreciation. Since then, there's been a number of historic homecomings. Now with DNA, you have over 90, you have 92 people who've already been, um, gotten their citizenship in the last um, two and a half years. And you have probably the largest group yet coming next month. And so okay. um, Sierra Leone is showing off. You know, they're opening up the doors. I mean, they, they, there's mm -hmm. no reversing it. And let me say this, it is not mm -hmm. just about DNA. It's not just about DNA, but it is important for that Sierra Leone is making that statement because right. other countries can follow that model but not limit mm -hmm. our, our our return to blood we have to also remind know that not everyone is going to um come back to the country of their choice with dna okay you know you okay. might not you might not test back to sierra leone but what if you want to make this home you know right. what i'm saying so 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 it's not just about heritage but what i do see in sierra leone is that what is drawing the population here is the heritage connection people are coming back to sierra leone because they're related here they're not coming back because they're choosing Sierra Leone or Ghana. They're coming back to Sierra Leone because Sierra Leone is their home. This is what they're finding mm -hmm. out through their research. Mm -hmm. They're tapping mm -hmm. their blood. They're seeing their DNA. Saying, hey, you a Timney. You understand? And once you know something like that, you have to go and see what it is. And when you find out that the people are giving you citizenship, you know, you don't have you don't have to um, lease whole land. You can free whole land. You can buy land permanently for your family in Sierra Leone. Oh man. Oh man, it don't cost too much. If you if you consider that it costs about three hundred dollars for the test, then you mm -hmm. consider maybe about you know four or five thousand dollars for your full process of getting your citizenship. Man, your whole family gonna benefit from that for every generation after you. So we're right. talking about restoring the rights of our lineages and mm -hmm. Sierra Leone gets it. They understand it. They're like, come on home. You are family. Home, right. So that's what I'm saying. Go where, you're, go where you're welcome. Go where people are opening the door for you already. And right. Sierra Leone is one of them places. Let me let me ask you this because, you know, I like that you talked about the family environment and you talked about how, you know, in the in United States, a lot of the youth, you know, you can't really tell them nothing. You're afraid to say something. And, you know, with this, you know, trap music and, you know, you got yeah. this, uh, what's that called, that music in Chicago, that drill music and stuff. It's, yeah, drill you know, young music. kids is going... Yeah, they're going, they're going crazy. But I noticed when I'm in Uganda, and I'm pretty sure it's close to Sierra Leone, you see a lot of uh, young kids um, just eager to learn. A lot of young kids yeah. is, uh, it's a family more, family-oriented environment. And you ain't got to worry about, oh, my son going to get shot tonight or something like that. But I want to talk more about, mm -hmm. because a lot of people who are coming over to uh, Sierra Leone or any country, is how do they support themselves? And some people... Are going to have to become entrepreneurs and they've never done it and people want to know what are chief Foley, what are some of the opportunities that are available to me in sierra leone to become an entrepreneur and what kind of skills do i need to have to come over there and do that because i've been working for somebody for a long time i've never owned a business before how do i prepare yeah. for that and, and and how can i impact society um, you know, through through privatization sector and through uh, you know economic stuff. How do I, what are the opportunities available to the African American or diaspora community wanting to come into Sierra Leone? Right, right. Well, that's a, that's a very good question. First of all, I think that um, collective economics is the best way to go about our business venture in any African country. 
I think that if we have um, 92 people who just got citizenship in the last two and a half years, that that 92 people should be able to open up the lane for African-American investment in any industry anywhere in this country um, very easily because now we're part and parcel. So um, that's one thing is that any investment should be a collective thing. But in Sierra Leone, you find um, very interesting what I would call native investments. Um, money is different here, bro, like you would know. Um, agriculture, for instance, you can make a lot of money from agriculture, from food, food production. Um, there's a lot of money involved in that. Printing, printing, print companies, a lot of money in print companies. Import, export, a lot of money in that. So it's really just about having a, uh, uh, you know, a team, whereas you can research the different industries that you would want to go into in order to sustain yourself. Now, for me, I sustain myself partially from consultancy. You know, there's a lot of people who are making Sierra Leone their destination, and it's good to consult the people who's already there so you can kind of know um, what to expect and kind of have some guidance on the ground. Um, so, um, you know, I'm able to turn all the lessons that I learned and all of the experience that I gained um, into a benefit for people that need it coming home. And at the end of the day, consultancy actually will save you a lot of a lot of money and a lot of time and help you in whatever investment you choose to do. So um, I have an opportunity to assist our people and at the same time um, generate some income for myself. Um, another way is, um, you know, you have tourism. Tourism is another industry that I believe um, African-Americans can play a dominant role in in certain markets. For instance, like you was talking about Ghana. They say in 2019, man, we spent over a billion dollars in Ghana, man. You know what I'm saying? O o over a million visitors to Ghana, and um, and we spent over a billion dollars. And we should, we should not have any discussions about citizenship in Ghana anymore since 2019. That should have been the year of final return. No more talk. But yet, um, I believe that certain people are are, are seeking to um, prolong our um, our return because every time we come back begging, they get paid. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so I, I'm seeing it happen in certain countries, but here in, in Sierra Leone, um, you also have minerals. You know, I, I don't want to jump over that as well. There's a lot of people that come to the country because of the abundance of minerals that's available. Um, I, I can't speak highly about the practices within the mining um, sector. I don't, I'm not involved in it. I know, don't know anything about gold or diamonds. But what I do know is that um, many of the people who come and leave with the resources don't look like us. And there's not too many African-American people or communities connected to this economy. Um, and we could be, we very much could be. Um, so minerals is a big thing. You know, they have all kinds, mean, they got culture, uh, 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 futile. they got gold in abundance. They have probably the most precious diamonds on earth here in terms of quality. Um, they have a lot of agrarian resources in abundance and even fish because we're along the coast. So it's like so, so many things you can get into. Um, transportation is another big one as well. Now that they're fixing the roads, you know, um, people are buying buses. You can buy a bus here and it can generate for you, um, you know, a nice profit, a nice profit per week, per month, however you run it, it will run constantly. And um, these are school buses. People, people are getting school buses in the diaspora and sending them here to family members that are driving them and making a lot of money. Um, technology, technology. Um, most of the technology in this country comes from a th another third world country or China, and it's, it's crap. You know, it, it's, going, it's going to begin to break in your hand in, in no time. So people value um, knockoff American or hand-me-down second, you know, uh, um, second-class American goods even more than brand-new China goods. So American um, goods, things that we have easy access to in the United States of America, um, also have great value here. So when we talk about import-export, we got to look at certain policies that's on the book, like AGOA, the African Growth and Development um, Agreement, which um, opens up trade arrangements between Africans or between the United States and African countries that we can readily exploit for our own selves. I went and met with the Minister of, uh, of uh, Trade and Industry here. That's the first thing he told me about. He said, "Why ain't, what's up with Agoa? Why aren't the black Americans using Agoa in Africa? 
why aren't you using it? It's there already since 2000. Why aren't the black Americans using AGOA to engage mm -hmm. in trade with African countries? And mm -hmm. it's because we're, we're, we're typically breaking down our return into an individual venture. It's not a mm. collective experience. And because we're coming back dolo like this, we're coming back weak. And, 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 and you know, when, Ch when Chinese people come in, man, they come in groups. It might be 50 Chinese right. people at the airport getting off the plane at the same time. Yeah, and I've seen they that. Come, they got, yeah, look, they, look, man, look, they got a place to stay. You know, some building that they already bought. They, you know, they're working. They ain't worrying about where they're going to work at. You know what I'm saying? And um, we really have to build that infrastructure for ourselves. Um, no one else will do that for 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 the for the uh, for the African diaspora, particularly not the not, not the African Americans. And I believe that African Americans play, can play a, a critical role in um, in leading the way in, in in several departments for the whole for the whole diaspora as it relates to repatriation. But um, that's some of the things I would say, man. Import export is 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 is, is, is would be ideal vehicles. You know, um, when I was in America at one point, I used to buy and sell vehicles. I used to go to the auctions. And then my brother had a car lot. He put it on his car lot and I make some money. And um, you know, vehicles, vehicle sale out here. When you think about people who's making enough money to sit down comfortably in Africa that has never left Africa, these are the kind of industries, the kind of businesses that they're involved in. You know, um, they're not involved in the typical kind of things that we think um, they will be involved in. They, they, we build systems of, of 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 resource exchange like i know people who farming on one hand who engage in transportation they might have two or three dirt bikes on the road at one time and then at the same time they got a shop you know they sell provisions so it's like you have to evolve into an entrepreneur when you come over here especially if you're trying to wing it for yourself but like i said in the beginning man i think the best way is to come as a team to really investigate and see what the best ways to invest are and then start to do things cooperatively, so that way we have that, um, you know, the risk factor is a lot, a lot less, and mm -hmm. um, hopefully the reward factor is a lot greater if we work together. Okay. So, yeah, that's what I would say. I think, I, I, man, it's so, I, I think it's, it's any kind of way to look at it. We can make a lot of money here. If you're in the construction, you can make a lot mm -hmm. of money in Sierra Leone because uh, that's where you see a lot of money being generated. At a lot of jobs as well. Um, they're, mm -hmm. they're repairing these roads. You know what I'm saying? They're building these high rises, you know, investing in the development of the country now. And so um, we got to get our foot in the door. OK, so let me you know, let me ask you this uh, for. You know, things like let's say if you want to move around, I do know the I was watching the, some things in Liberia and some of the people. Uh, it's called the channel's called Liberia to the world. Shout out to that, brother. And uh, which is right next to where you're at. And he was saying that sometimes in Liberia, when you're there, sometimes the banks will, can run out of cash. So and uh, and it's sometimes it might be difficult to get banking. I know I was with Brother Ghana Dan in, um, in, in Uganda. He was talking about that. He came and visited. But in your opinion, talk to me about this. You know, if you want to get a bank account, setting up financial transfers and things like that, is that difficult for a person that you know from american and you're trying to come in there and get your infrastructure with your money and stuff set up how how is that process and um and and, and obviously um you know exchanging money and things like that how have you found that as yeah. far as being difficult well hit well here in Sierra Leone, i've had to adapt to it you know um money is free, is more free flowing in america it's so easy to get to some change you know go to atm you know pay for something with, you know with, with a visa card you know, with, you know, with your credit card or whatever. But here, in most exchange, you're gonna need cash, and um, and usually it's a lot of cash. You know, in terms of the exchange, here, um, for a hundred dollars, I get I get uh, one million. You know what I'm saying? So just imagine how the rate of exchange already is. But um, in terms of setting up bank accounts, it's not difficult at all. Um, what what you should do is always set up a dollar account. Make sure you have a dollar account. Make sure that you don't have to um, you don't have to exchange money on the market. You can do it. You know your account can just immediately exchange once it reaches here, and money can go in and out the country more easily. Here, I think that costs about a hundred dollars to open up a uh, 
the American, I mean, the, the dollar account. But um, you also have other means of doing things. I know a lot of people have to use, um, what do you call the services, man? Like these Western unions. And okay. these, uh, yeah, you know, they come in handy out here. You might not be used to using them in the States, but out here they come in handy. You have to know how to um, um, utilize those little fast cash you know, um, 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 services, the, the, the transfer, the money transfer services. They're very, very key. Um, but you know, the banking is dope. I use UBA, you know, United Bank of Africa, which is, um, I believe it's out of Nigeria, but they got branches everywhere. They even got a branch in New York city. So, um, it's a pan African bank. Most of the countries where, where in West Africa has a branch of the bank. And, um, if I went anywhere, it would be very easy for, for me to work, but they also have like native banks. In Sierra Leone, they have banks that are just for the country. And so sometimes you don't want to settle yourself down in one account like you might do in America. You want to diversify your accounts. You want to make sure you have a dollar account where you can deal with your international money. You want to make sure you have a good um, national account as well for your transactions here. Another thing is that they have, um, they have like what they call um, electronic transfer, I guess, mm -hmm. I guess what you would say. You know, um, right. you can go to like a, a place, the same place where you can go buy your prepaid um, 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 credits for your phone, and you can right. send money. You can send money to any the country, anybody. Like mobile right money. To their, right to their, yeah, exactly, like mobile money. So a lot of things is mobile money out here. You know, people always ask, like, you know, uh, I don't see a lot of Sierra Leoneans on Facebook like that. And I'm like, well, only 3% of the country actually use the internet, and most of the people here is on WhatsApp. You know what I'm saying? So we use different mediums, but we still do facilitate the same kind of exchange. Um, so yeah, man. I mean, that's 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 you know that's how we answer your question for real, for real. All right, let's talk about like I know that I I can see you know, your internet's coming in pretty good, and a lot of people, you know, I, I know that Liberia um, and certain countries are are trying to come back because I'm, I'm using them because they were in the war too for so long. And um, in comparisons, you know, there are other countries that are a little bit more stable. But I do see that Sierra Leone is improving on a lot of its, you know, infrastructure. For people oh, that yeah. want to know about like electricity, um, or you know, um, you know, internet speeds, stuff like that, mm -hmm. what would you tell them? Because obviously, it's much different than living in the USA. Well, but what are the challenges there for? For, for people that, you know, if they want to come and they've never been to Africa before and think about living there, what do they got to get used to as far as like the day-to-day -day, um, infrastructural changes and traffic and stuff like that? Yeah, well, definitely you hit it on the money right there, Tra travel. You know, it's going to take you a little longer to get around short distances. You know, um, the tra the, the, I would say the roads, the traffic is not as well organized. Um, um, as what we're used to in, in the in the West, and um, there's not that many rules about how to drive. You know, there's no speed limits and this or that. You know, in the city you might get some speed bumps and a few street lights, but in general, in the country, the roads are pretty poor. To be honest with you, um, the road infrastructure is something that I believe we have opportunity to really play a key role in improving for the people here in this country. Um, but definitely the roads is something that, you know, they're problematic. And uh, the majority of the people take public transportation, particularly here in the big city. Um, and, you know, it's not safe. Like right now you got COVID, you know, you, you, you can get into a minivan and it'd be 18, 19 people in that joint, man. Nobody got a mask on. They ain't thinking about COVID. You'd be like, oh, man, you know, so it's just that, um, it's best to have your own vehicle here. Um, fuel crisis happens sometimes. I'll say once, at least every few months, the price is going to go up. There's going to be a fuel shortage. Of course, that comes from the outside. That's not something that we can control here, but you can look forward to that. Um, depending on where you're at, you will have access to lights. Like I live on the west coast of Freetown. Um, light is not a problem on this side of town. Um, but we still get our outages. It might get an outage every month. Every week, you might get a little two-hour, three-hour outage to come back on. Um, it, don't, it, it, it doesn't cost much for the lights, but for the internet, for the Wi-Fi, for, for the Wi-Fi, um, it, it's, it's a lot more expensive than what it would be in the state. Like, for instance, I pay $100 for unlimited 
Wi-Fi every month, but um, it's unlimited and it's it, you know it has it has a fast speed, and um and the company that I use is called Orange, and Orange they're like they're like throughout different countries out here, so they got a pretty good um pretty good service. You know, if I have any problem, I can call up; they can solve it for me. So um mm -hmm. you know, it's like that. You know, when you come here, you're not really gonna be moving around too much. And, and mm -hmm. enter, you know, mixing in with the regular flow of things when you first get here anyway. But you want to need internet services. Um, certain sides of town have poor, poor um, internet service. You just got to know where to go. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's still shaky like that here in this country. Um, if you go into the rural areas, oh man, good luck. You know, mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. with internet services and stuff like that. But there is, um, there is a way that we manage it uh, most of the most of the rural areas have central towns, have big towns that connect all mm -hmm. the different villages. And so long as you can get to them towns, you can get to internet, you can get the uh, lights and things like that. And there's also what I would call a solar revolution happening in Sierra Leone. People here mm -hmm. are really digging the solar, man. Like they, they they don't mind buying the solar and hooking it up in their house. They don't mind. We tired of waiting for the government to come with the with the system. And the mm -hmm. solar allows the people an opportunity to uh, get their children a chance to study late at night. You know what I'm saying? They don't have to go to sleep as soon as it gets dark. You know what I'm saying? So it, it, it's, it's an immediate improvement in the life, not only of a child, but of a whole family, once they got a little bit of access to some, to some solar lights. For now, it's still expensive for the average person, but um, that's also one of the things that people do in terms of energy, in terms of lights. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Now, um, I would say get a vehicle. If you come here, you got a vehicle. The best way is that you have a driver because they don't have the same kind. I'm telling you, bro, they don't got the same kind of um, um, traffic system. You know, ain't no traffic police. Ain't nobody giving out no tickets. You know, people drive however they drive. And um, you've got to be very safe in these roads. And the people here know how to drive better than what you're going to know how to drive when you first get here. So I would say definitely um, look, you know, get a vehicle and invest in a driver and secure your secure your own transportation when you first get here. And if you're able to maintain that, then that's what's up. Me, I take public transportation. Man. I'll be on dirt bikes. I'll be on KKs. I'll be in, in, in taxis. It don't matter. You know, uh, I'm, 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 you know, I'm cut like that. I don't got no problem with it. But the average person coming over here is not going to be able to, you know, right. move around in that kind of situation. Okay. Um, yeah, not going. You're not going to enjoy that. And usually, you can rent a vehicle here for like eighty to a hundred dollars a day. Um, okay. Depending on, yeah, depending on you know what you're trying to do. If you're going into the interior, you're going to use it for a couple of days. You know, it might be a little bit cheaper. But if you're going to use it for one day in town, of course, that's going to be a lot cheaper than going to the interior. But yeah, people rent vehicles um, and things like that. Also, um, just as a side note, when you repatriate, you're not looking to buy land and build a house tomorrow. There's a there's a transitional period. You have to have um, transitional housing and and all of that, all those things established. Um, you, you mentioned the Exodus Alliance earlier and um, some of what we do. And one of the things that we're trying to do is create a network. Whereas it's more easy for individual repatriates to touch, to touch home and be able to have access to all those facilities like that, and not really have to worry about, um, you know, how they're gonna get from A to B or where the best place to shop is, and you know, um, and things like that. You got guidance on the ground um, that's provided by the community of people that's already here. So that's one of the things that we really plan to tackle. Um, you know, residential living is very important as well because most people coming here is going to want to maintain a certain standard of living that is rare here. You know, it's very, very rare. You, know, you ain't mm -hmm. going to find people with that standard of living just walking around. Not not the standard mm -hmm. that I know most of us is, is, is looking for. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to create that for ourselves without marginalizing mm -hmm. ourselves. We're going to have to be able to create that living environment for ourselves. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I think everything should be self-contained. We should we should be thinking about solar. We should be thinking about you know um, 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 vehicles. That's why I said you know one of the main businesses here is selling vehicles, bro. 
mm-hmm. getting vehicles, bringing them over and selling them. As long as you got vehicles, your, your transportation problem is, is, is not a, you know, worrying about transportation. Mm-hmm. No so problem. So we should okay. invest. Yeah, yeah. So we we should invest in those markets where we're going to need the the the, the, um, the assistance at. You know, we mm-hmm. should be investing in the housing market, the Airbnb market. You know, mm-hmm. some people have unfinished houses here that we can buy and finish up. And shit, we ain't got to spend money in no hotel. Yeah, you, you was talking about that. There's a lot of unfinished. I heard you talk about that on the Exodus, um, on the Exodus Alliance show, RJ and Mike. People have a lot of unfinished houses that they don't fix up. Yeah. 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 You know, what happens is that um, Freetown, before the war in, in, in 1991, they had a population of about 200,000. It very clean, very small um, um, West African um, capital city. But um, during the war, man, there was so much refuge. So many people left their villages in the interior and flooded to the cities that today you got over 2 million population in Freetown. So from 1991 to 2021, just in that 30 years, you have um, a tenfold population boom in Freetown. And so, mm-hmm. of course, you got issues like housing. Where would these people mm-hmm. live? So they begin to build um, houses and communities up on the mountainside, you know, mm. without paying for the land, just grabbing land, seizing land and building what they need to build as refugees during the war. And mm. so um, the grid, that's why the grid is so weak, because the mm-hmm. city has grown without planning. The population mm-hmm. has grown without planning for the city. And so mm-hmm. now what you find is that a lot of people are beginning to move to the rural area of Freetown, which is mm-hmm. wide open, beautiful area beaches man just untapped Mm -hmm. so people who can afford it are going out to these rural areas where they're still close Mm -hmm. enough to the center city to come Mm -hmm. you know to go come and go within 30 minutes but once Mm -hmm. they home man they man they in paradise very close to the capital city so that's how people are looking at you know coming back and like i said man it's the group buy it's 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 Mm -hmm. knowing what you want to do and having a team together to do it um, mm-hmm. do it with even if it's just you you're still going to need a team over here that's going to be able to help you identify right. and broker your deals and things like that so um but yeah man yeah absolutely there's a lot of homes here you know a couple years ago they had a mudslide and over um 1000 people died within minutes bro a mudslide Whoa. and um yeah a, a whole mountainside broke off and and buried a whole community and um it happened because people be building these houses on mountainsides and there is like no regulations for how high you build or how low you dig and like the government the governance is poor you know in that sense and it caused a lot of life man um mm-hmm. just a few years ago you know what i'm saying so you got to be careful about buying land out here bro you don't mm-hmm. want you want to buy land from somebody who don't really own the land because right burn. yeah you know i've heard it happen a lot yeah yeah, it can happen to you, but the, mm-hmm. the good thing is that the government owns most of the land that's available that really has high value. So you can mm-hmm. literally go to the Ministry of Land and walk your way through and they say these are the properties available in the area that mm-hmm. you're interested. That we oh, so that's safe. Okay. If you see something that you want, come let us know you want that land right there that the government has. And we can facilitate a buy oh okay 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 that's 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 yes. that's that's that's, that's really good in, in cases the but let me ask you this for people who want to know about you know a little bit how to contact you or mm-hmm. um or what you're how can they contact you how can they find you on youtube how can they find you on social media outlets yeah well um you can find me on on facebook very easily my name there is mansa fode ajamu um you can find me there very easily. I'm very active on Facebook. I don't know why. I always had. I always have been since I got on it. I love Facebook. It's it's very easy to communicate on, and get a lot of um, important things done there. But um, you can also follow follow the movement, um, Galileon Union, which is uh, an organization, a movement of three different organizations that was created over the last six years, um, that we engage in United Front work. Basically, we have a Pan-Africanist organization known as the Black Star Action Network International. We have a uh, Gullah Geechee um, heritage organization, people who are Gullah Geechee of the heritage, the people who have the, uh, the actual lineage, the bloodlines. You know, we're coming together to form our sense of community as well within the 21st century. 
And so uh, we have the Gullah Nation of North America, which is a nonprofit 501c3 organization in the United States. And then here in Freetown, in Sierra Leone, we have a nonprofit company called the Gullah Redemption Mission Sierra Leone. So all three of these entities work together as the Gullah Leone Union. And we have a common single website. You can go check it out. It's uh, GullahLeone.org, G-U-L-L-A-H. L E O N E Gullah Leon .org. Um, from there you can you can go um, follow the links to our uh, to our YouTube channel which is Gullah House Media and um, for a private email you can email me at Gullah Chief Ajamu G U L L A H Chief C H I E F Ajamu A J A M U at Gmail dot com um, and that's pretty much how you can get in contact with me. Yeah. Um, for those who are seeking um, to visit, to invest, to uh, to repatriate to Sierra Leone, um, my wife and I also do have a consultancy company called uh, Gullah Dugu Services LLC. We're based out of Atlanta right now. In terms of where we're registered at in the United States, we are a company. It's not uh, just a side hustle or nothing like that. We provide um, 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 consultancy services, investment management services, and, um, and all that to people who particularly are coming from our community seeking to establish a base here in Sierra Leone. And you can always check us out at uh, gulladugu.com. G-U-L-L-A-H-D-U-G-U, gulladugu.com. You can go there and um, you know, see that for a little consultancy to get the ball rolling. And um, and uh, I'm more than confident that we have the ability to provide you with um, excellent, you know, um, consultancy. Whether you're looking to do some business, whether you're looking to get your citizenship, whether you're looking to just visit, you know, just just come and meet some people. No matter what it is you're trying to do in Sierra Leone, we've established mm -hmm. a uh, a consultancy business to be able to help you learn more about even the culture and the history. You know, I do mm -hmm. historical and cultural consultancy as well man um there's somebody doing a movie right now and they reached out to me and was like man i need you for my historical consultant you know i need your narrative you know what i'm saying so um just spreading the knowledge and making sure that people are more informed and more secure in what they're doing when it comes to spending money and breaking bread on the continent the worst feeling here is getting burnt and i've been i've got burnt here i got burnt here before i ever got here and um I got burnt in America too. It's just the whole point of being safe and not lowering our guard and being able to be transparent and um and you know accountable in everything that we do, especially as it deals with money, um because our people need these services and this country ain't ready for what for what it is that we need. We have to accommodate ourselves. Okay, so guys, I definitely thank you for this great interview uh check out we'll put all the information below the brother will send this to me we have it there available for you guys and always remember keep it real king ganda forever we out